And who, one of the first things you did or one of the main things that you accomplished when you were there was capturing Abu Zubaydah, yeah, is that right? Yeah, can you Abu exp- Zubaydah. Can you walk me through how that went down? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a story. It became the defining event of not just my career, really. It became the defining event of my life. A- and I'm not overstating that. So I get to Pakistan, January of 2002, and my very first day, uh, the station chief says, I want you to come up with a standard operating procedure for taking down an Al-Qaeda safe house. He said, we're just not doing it. I said, sure. So I went back to my office, and I, s- <laughs> I sat there with a, with a legal pad, and I was thinking, all right, so if I'm, if I'm going to take down an Al-Qaeda safe house, how would I do that? And I thought, well, I'd, I'd want it to be dark, right? And I wrote 0200 at the top of the page. I mean, in Pakistan, as many people as they have there, they just roll the sidewalks up at night. It's, it's like a ghost town, the whole wow. country at, at night. So um, I thought, uh, I'm going to need I'm gonna need partners. I mean, you've got to invite the Pakistanis because it's their country. You know, you have to, I don't don't mean to sound crass, but you have to allow them to believe that they're in charge, you know, even if they're not. That's a a spy tactic, right? Yeah, yeah. Make it all, make them think that it's all their idea. And and 9-11 was an open criminal investigation, so you have to invite the FBI, as awful as that is. But, I mean, I would rather work with the Pakistanis than the FBI any day, (laughs) morons. So, uh, so I wrote, you know, teams, you had two Pakistanis, two CIA, two FBI, and I would need a bunch of stuff. So I need like battering rams and guns and ammo and night vision goggles and bulletproof vests. And I made this whole laundry list of stuff. So I sent a cable to headquarters and I said, um, can you give me $50,000 seed money and I'll start buying this stuff. Boom. Six hours later, I had $50,000. Money, believe me, was no problem. I mean, vast amounts of money. We have a lot of time. I can tell you some fun stories. <laughs> so I went online, galls.com. It's a police supply house in Kentucky. Uh, and I ordered everything I needed. I ordered the bulletproof vests and battering rams and guns and ammunition and the night vision goggles and walkie-talkies and a satellite dish and... I ordered everything. I spent the whole 50 grand. So two weeks later, it all arrives. And um, we set up our teams. And uh, I got a tip that there was this Al-Qaeda safe house. Here's the address. So I called the Pakistani uh, colonel that I was, he was my normal contact. And I said, um, Colonel Muhammad, uh, let's let's hit this house tonight. I've been telling him, look, you know, I'm waiting for this equipment to come. And, of course, we're going to leave it all here as a gift for you and your brave men. And, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to sort of talk them up. So I called him and I said, okay, the stuff's in. I got this tip. Let's hit this this address 2 o'clock in the morning. He's like, okay. So I get to FBI people, one of whom is totally awesome and we still stay in touch. The other was an ongoing problem for all of us at the CIA. CIA and the FBI hate each other. Right. And they have since the founding of the CIA. (laughs) And we still hate each other. So, um, 0200, we sneak up to the door of this house and we, boom, we bash the door in with a with a battering ram and there are these two kids one was 18 and one was 19 they put their hands up and then they burst into tears both of them one of them's crying i'm cuffing him and he's like "Uh, can i call my mother Uh, she's gonna be so worried about me and i said to this buddy of mine i said this is al-qaeda this is what we've been so afraid of they're children so I was like, no, you're not going to fucking call your mother. You're going to, to uh, jail. We took them to the Rawalpindi jail. How did you know for sure they were Al-Qaeda? Because I said so. Because you said so. You know, I, I'm being facetious, uh-huh. of course. Um, the, the rule that we came up with was if you're an Arab in Pakistan with no passport and no plausible explanation for what you're doing there, you're Al-Qaeda. 
right? Arabs can't get visas to Pakistan unless they're Saudi, Kuwaiti, Emirati, and have lots of money to spend. So if you're just some kid from some village in Tunisia, Mm -hmm. you shouldn't be in Pakistan. One of them went so far as to tell me, not, not one of these two kids, but a guy later on, that he was there to study Arabic. And I said, Arabic. You know, of course, that they don't speak Arabic in this country. And he just looks at me. And a lot of these guys were pretty well trained by Al Qaeda. Like they, they all had the same story. I mean, like exactly to the word, the same story. They were taught this in their training in the camps in Afghanistan that if you're caught, tell the Americans that um, you flew here to volunteer at an orphanage in Afghanistan. And you flew through Dubai, and then when you got to Karachi, you got in a taxi, and you asked the taxi driver to take you to the Grand Mosque to thank God for your safe arrival. There is no Grand Mosque in Karachi. The Grand Mosque is in Islamabad. Wow. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you accidentally left your passport in the taxi, so you lost your passport. That's why you don't have it. And so you're waiting for your embassy to give you a new passport. And then when the Americans started bombing, you got scared. So you had to, I mean, like a hundred different guys told me exactly the same story. And none of it, none of it added up. So we started putting them at the Rawalpindi jail. And then after a while, uh, one of the Pakistanis came to me and said, listen, the jail's full. We, we don't know what to do with these guys. And we don't want them here in our country. And he says, I know you don't want to send them back to their country because they hadn't been interrogated. We didn't know, are they, are they just you know kids who took up the fight because they had nothing better to do? Are they masterminds? We caught bin Laden's computer guy. We caught bin Laden's um, mechanic. We got bin Laden's cook. We got bin Laden's doctor. So they've got information that we're going to want. So I, I cabled headquarters and I said, the jail's full and the packs want them out. So what do I do with them? And I get this cable back saying, put them on a C-12 and send them to Guantanamo. And I wrote back and I said, Guantanamo, Cuba? Like, why would I send them to Cuba? And they said, um, this has been the subject of, of much discussion at headquarters We're going to hold them in Cuba for two or three weeks until we can figure out which federal district to charge them in because crimes were committed in the, in the DC area in the Eastern district of Virginia. That's where the Pentagon's based Mm -hmm. um, and and Dulles airport in the Eastern district of Massachusetts because one of the planes took off from Boston and the uh, Southern and Eastern districts of New York. So there are four federal districts we can charge them with terrorism in. Okay. And I said, "Ah, that's a great idea. Just hold them in Cuba for two or three weeks. And then once we started sending them to Cuba, somebody on Dick Cheney's staff said, you know what? They have no rights in Cuba because the Cubans have never signed the lease agreement, like in protest. So if they have no rights in Cuba, that means we don't have to put them on trial. And I was like, Well, but the Constitution says that they have their right to face their accusers in a court of law. Right. Well, but they don't get the Constitution's protections. Not Cuba. Everybody gets the Constitution's protections. If you're under the command and control of the United States, on territory controlled by the United States, right? I mean, that's... I'm not a lawyer, but... Mm. The Constitution is very important to me. And on my very first day at the CIA with 300 other people, I put my right hand in the air and I promised to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I I have a, a real hard time thinking that I was the only one in the room that day who actually meant it. 